Uh, yeah. Hopefully it works fine with Linux. I hope so. Yeah. No. You may want to verify that first. Yeah. There it goes. All right, perfect. Works fine. Perfect. And then the laser. There it is. Okay. Uh, ladies, oh, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to present Austin Pascal. Hi, my name is Austin Haskell, and I'm going to talk about my thesis project, which I've titled Evolution of Strong Structures. So the problem I was trying to solve was after a natural disaster like a hurricane or a tornado or earthquake, anything like that, there's a lot of devastation, uh, destroys homes, costs governments billions of dollars in repairs. And so I'd like to try to alleviate some of that. And through that, I um, used an unlikely source that you probably wouldn't think of in computer science. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so these are two of the questions that I was asking. What would uh, resist these forces and also what would they look like? So um, I went to an unlikely source and I went to evolution to try to solve this problem. So uh, let's talk about what evolution is, just in case you haven't had a biology class uh, recently. So evolution is the process in which a group of animals evolves over time. So here we have a population of gophers. And let's say that a hawk comes through and eliminates some of the gophers that maybe weren't as fast or weren't as camouflaged in the environment. And then the remaining gophers um, mate and produce offspring for the next generation. And as you can see, this one actually developed a mutation that turned it orange rather than blue. And this mutation could be a beneficial one. Maybe it will hide from hawks now. It could be in like a area that has a lot of browns or oranges and act as camouflage. Or it could stick out like a sore thumb. So this could be an actual problem for that specific gopher. And then this process is repeated over and over and over again until the animal fully adapts to its environment. So. I mentioned that I used evolution, so the way you do that in computer science is through something called the genetic algorithm, which mimics evolution through the process of natural selection, breeding, and mutation. And this, I have a handy flowchart just to describe how this actually works. So you create an initial population of some type of data, in my case that would be buildings, and from that you determine how well each one does. And then you have a hawk come through, which in this case you just delete the unfit members. And you create a new population from the surviving members. And then again, this process is repeated with random mutation thrown in. So here's some examples of what genetic algorithms can actually produce. So right here is a radio antenna used on satellites that is better at capturing the actual radio frequencies that we want and sorting out the interference. And this one over here is a car chassis that's better um, suited to frontal collisions and it dissipates the forces properly. So after learning about genetic algorithms, I asked myself, how can they be used to make stronger buildings? And also, how do you simulate a complex system like RAIN? So how do you actually create buildings? Like, how am I doing that? So I chose to use tetrahedra. So uh, tetrahedrons are made of triangles. It's pretty easy to pop into a physics simulation and also render on the screen. And from there, you pick a face and build off of it, and you continue this process until you reach the desired size for a building. And that's represented by a series of numbers between 0 and 2. And so if you take a tetrahedron and you label the faces going uh, counterclockwise, you would build first off of this face, and then from the tetrahedron we just made, you'd build off of its first face, and so on and so forth. Um, and so this is an easy abstraction on top of the tetrahedrons. And also, that genome right here would actually look like this whenever it fully ran. So you have to have a way to breed things in uh, evolution and genetic algorithms. So how I do that is I take two buildings right here. Uh, they're pretty oddly shaped. What we're going to do is we're going to create two splices in their arrays, and then we're going to combine them together into a new building that has a portion of each parent's genome inside it. And these uh, numbers down here are simplified. The list for these would be much longer. So also, how do you mutate a structure like this? 
So you just take the array and you increment or decrement one of the items in it. If you decrement a zero, you get a two. If you increment a two, you get a zero. So it's cyclical in that nature. And mutation can have an actual effect. I mean, it doesn't seem like it, just changing one number around. But just by changing a single two, you've basically rotated this entire building around its axis. And mutating further, you can actually get kinks, and you get circles, and you can get other complex structures inside of it. So we also have to have the hawk in our simulation. So the hawk in this case is how many pieces broke off, how far did it move, how large is the building, and how many times does it fold into itself. So we don't want some large gangly structure. That's uh, what number three is for. Uh, we don't want it to skid a lot, like wherever it's planted, and we don't want it to fall apart, obviously. So this simulation that I um, created has a wind force simulation as well as particle simulations to simulate the force of the actual rain. And the red pieces right here that are breaking off um, are being counted against this building. Uh, this is a simulation from an early member of the generation, so it's not very good. It's lopsided. You can see it's falling over. Pieces are breaking off constantly. And so uh, let's get into some of the results. So I ran the simulation with 128 members, so 128 gophers. And then I ran it for 300 generations, which is on the smaller end for genetic algorithm, but the simulation is pretty complex. So uh, 300 generations actually takes four days to run. So a longer generation of 1,000 would take a week and a half. So here are some of the fun results. So we start off with a member of the population looking like this. Um, you can see that it's got a lot of weight towards the top of it, so it's probably going to fall over. And there's not very many contact points to the ground, so it's probably going to skid quite a bit too. But after 300 generations, you actually end up with a tower-like shape. So towards the bottom, you have a lot of contact points, so it's taking advantage of a larger coefficient of friction. You also have it having equal distribution of its mass. So there's not a whole lot at the top, and it kind of increases as you go down. On a separate run of the simulation, we arrived at this as the member of a, the first generation. But after 300, it actually evolved into more of a shark fin-like shape. And um, the representation's kind of lost a little bit since it's 2D. But this edge right here is actually a wind edge that was splitting the wind on two directions from it. And again, this one has a large contact with the ground, so it's probably not going to skid all that much. For this last result slide, so we start off with this almost elephant-looking uh, creature at the beginning. Again, weight's not really distributed in a meaningful way. There's not a whole lot of contact with the ground. But if you go down and ask the physics people down in the basement, they'll tell you that one of the best structures for this would actually be a dome-like shape. So it was pretty nice seeing basically a dome pop out of the simulation. And this one has the added benefit of not allowing rain to collect on top of it. So continuing this on, I would want to multi-thread the simulation itself. So the evaluation was multi-threaded, but the simulation itself was not. So running simulations for longer would get us to a more perfect answer. And then also implementing other building types, like spherical buildings, cubed buildings, uh, things like that, and then also just general improvements on the simulation. Um, it's fairly slow at this point, but it's the fastest I could get it. And just a general reflection. Physics engines are really hard, so um, especially if you're using experimental features. Um, I had to learn a lot of new mathematics for this, like vector calculus, and it's really enjoyable to like set something up and then come back four days later and see like actual results pop out of something that you wrote. And that's it. Thank you. So uh, underneath this, one of the uh, aspects doing the heavy lifting is the physics engine. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? So the physics engine was written with, a, with bullet physics and OpenGL. Um, the OpenGL portion does not run during the actual simulation because it slows it down. Um, so to create the particles, there's a so to calculate the forces, there's a ray cast. So you just look at each face from the direction of the wind. And that does a small portion of the force. But I also wanted to include in rain piling up in certain locations, because I noticed that happened whenever I just did a straight particle simulation. 
So every tick of the simulation, it adds about a thousand rain particles to the simulation. Uh, they're a little bit heavier than normal rain. That's just to speed up the simulation a little bit. Um, and so it just runs through that for uh, a specified number of ticks of the simulation. I think in the case of most of these, I ran them for a minute of simulated time. Uh, just any longer just took way too long. Like uh, like car like just yeah. So how the physics simulation is now, you could throw whatever you want. It literally just loads a model with a mass and a big table of like specifications for it. So if you had something you specifically wanted to throw at it, like if you want to throw rubber ducks or something, you could just import a rubber duck model and tell it what um, masses and other properties you want. Uh, yeah. So when you initially run the first generation, typically you'd get fitness scores of around 2,000. And the, the best fitness score you could ever get is um, around 150 to 100, somewhere around there. That's just because of the volume of the shape. You can't get zero. Um, so it started off around 2,000. And by the end of the simulation, you'd get around a 200 to 20 um, fitness score. So I don't know what factor that is off the top of my head. but a significant improvement. Yeah. Did you get any weird results? Yeah, um, so originally I allowed mutation to also add or subtract a tetrahedron. And that had the effect of buildings evolving to be empty because you can't have things break off and you can't have a volume. So they would actually get fitness scores of zero, which is theoretically the best you could potentially get. So that was odd. And then a lot of times it would just evolve to be flat so that we, it wouldn't get hit by as much rain, and it would have a really high like friction force on it, so it wouldn't skid whatsoever. Yeah. So, so you mentioned uh, contact point to the ground and friction. Uh, I, I'm taking that to, to mean that the buildings sit on top of the ground and they're not into built into the ground from the basement or anything. No. Yeah, they sit on top of so the ground directly. So Uh, no, but that would be like something I would want to implement. Okay, that's fresh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. You mentioned this fitness score a couple mm -hmm. times. What, what is that? Is that something from the world of architecture or physics? Or? Uh, so that's how well it's adapted to its environment. So in this case, it's a combination uh, of these four criteria. So the number of pieces broke off is just an integer. You take the integer, and then you there's a weighted sum with how many times it folds into itself. That's also added into it. Um, the volume, and then how far it moves are other factors. And this just goes into a, an equation that pops out a, um, a floating point number, and that's what they're sorted in uh, based off of. Is this something you came up with, or is this some well-known? Uh, this the combination of all four of these is something I came up with, but the like the principle of a fitness factor is like needed for a genetic algorithm to actually work. Cool. Yeah. So throughout much of your career here, uh, you've written programs that don't run very long. This one ran for four days. Yeah. What sort of differences did you learn? What lessons did you learn there? Make sure it ran. Yeah, you got to make sure it doesn't crash. <laughs> um, so a big thing is just testing. So what I would do is I would lower simulation times to test like these scores. So like instead of testing for a minute, I would just test for like five seconds. That way I could get some kind of result and see if some things are at least evolving a little bit. Because if you, if you want to hit play and then just sit there for four days, you could. But like I would want to be developing in that time. Um, yeah. So you, you talked a little bit about maybe ways to improve the performance, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think you said it, but can you remind me some of the things you, you could do? Did you say it was single threaded? So yeah, the simulation itself is single threaded. Um, would, would making it multi-threaded make any difference? 
Yeah, so right now, currently, all the collision data and the rate casting, all that happens on a single thread. So they're, they're taking turns whenever they're doing this calculation. Um, so doing it multi-threaded, because the two of them aren't entirely dependent on each other, so you could separate them and have those calculations running concurrently. Processor bound work that's happening, or uh, it's mostly processor bound. Um, you can get bullet physics to run on a GPU. Just with all the experimental stuff I was dealing with, uh, I chose to just focus on getting it to work. Yeah. What sort of experimental stuff? So a lot of the fracturing stuff is still listed as experimental. Um, for example, I actually submitted a pull request because there was a bug in one of the, uh, the experimental objects. It didn't copy over something in the copy constructor. So just dealing with that, because like for like three days, I was like, why isn't this working? Why isn't this working? And it was actually a small bug in bullet physics um, because none of that stuff is certified to work. Like they have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just dealing with that. Um, all of their experimental stuff has almost no documentation whatsoever. So it was mostly just reading demos and source code that they provided. Um, one of which, uh, one of the sections was actually commented out, and it said there's probably a better solution, but they didn't provide one. So I had to just uncomment that to actually get the uh, like breaking to work. Uh, cool. Is there anyone? Yeah, hopefully. Any other right. questions? Thank you. All right, cool.